So, should we continue? Um, we, I, w I was discussing then how to describe the, the change, how to describe the change, and I gave you some examples of how to do that. There are some other alternatives, but there are some important things. First, we need to, uh, to, pr uh, to get a protocol to describe the changes. What it means that we need to be consistent in time and space in the, descri in the description of <coughs> the changes that uh, are going on on, on, the, on the land. When we get these uh, descriptions, we may start to, uh, to analyze what is going on with the drivers. What, which factors operate on the land to determine changes in, in land use. And here we've, we face a, a common, problem, common problem in many regional analyses. We cannot devise experiments. In the, in the traditional way. So we cannot uh, parcelize the Chaco region, say, well, these parcels will get transformed, those others will not, and so on, and assign the treatments, for example, the transformation, in, in a random way. This is a, a major problem because our, inf our capacity to make inference is compromised. So, one way to uh, deal with this uh, problem is being clear that we are not proving any relationship between factors and land use change. We cannot do it. The best things that we can do it and it is important, uh, and it will have an impact on devising policies and operating in the systems, is to build in hypotheses. We are not quite sure about uh, how much we may trust on these hypotheses. And that's something that we need to keep in mind when we uh, get into uh, <clears throat> in this part of the analysis of this diagram. How we do that? Uh, the, the, oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, we need to start to analyze what are the uh, factors that may operate. And there are many things write in and analyze it. There are paper from uh, Lambin that got a lot of thinking on, on how land gets transformed. And deforestation is always drive by three proximal factors, changes in infrastructure, change, uh, agricultural expansion, or logging. Behind, behind these proximal factors, there are some underlying factors that may determine uh, the expansion of the agriculture, the logging or the development of infrastructure. Factors that are associated with demography, with economy, with technological change, institutional factors, and cultural factors. And there are also some factors that trigger those changes. So we may have these factors <coughs> and that uh, may determine these proximal ones, but we need to get an environmental, an economic, or a political factor that trigger the change. What are these changes? Well, for example, in, in, in Argentina, in the Chaco, when in, uh, there were a lot of these factors operating. But what kind of uh, make a change on the rate of transformation 
was a trigger related with an economic and political factor, a change in the exchange rate, exchange rate of the peso dollar. This factor that was not listed here, and clearly is not the proximal factor, kind of trigger the transformation. For the trigger to operate, we need to have the conditions associated with the underlying factors um, operating. <clears throat> but, you know, this is a general framework, and we like it. It's perfect, but we need something to operate uh, locally. Uh, uh, um, we need to operate locally. There are factors that are uh, driving these changes that are general, are global. And you know, they, uh, we are not discovering anything. One of them is the increase in the price and in the demand of agricultural commodities, motivated by uh, political, cultural, technological, social changes in some other part of the world, China, India, the, uh, Southeast Asia, or whatever. They were also factors associated not with the demand, but with the development of something related with the commodity, but not with the demand. The development of financial market for these things, for these baskets of commodities. You know, the banks put together soybean, a little bit of oil, uranium, and develop an, a financial instrument that uh, <coughs> is put in the market. And this generates um, changes in the perception, at least, of the demand for some commodities and some speculation. I was, uh, just a parenthesis, um, for some particular commodities that you may track because they are very specific, or uh, they are not commodities, some products. These future markets, you, know, you know how the future market operates. They uh, there is a, a, an, an expectancy on how much uh, Argentina will, uh, how much soybean will produce Argentina, and say, well, I pay you $300 per ton, and so I buy your production. The production is not there. It's just a promise of production, and Someone say, well, I think that uh, the demand will increase. Let me get this for 320. No, 330. And finally, when the uh, soybean is harvested, the price, the, the price that received the, the farmer is 300. But the price that get uh, in the market is sold to, I don't know, the Chinese, is 400. And there are some studies on how many trades happens from the first one to the final. When it, it's for wheat, when it finally gets into the production of, of bread. 25. So this is a, an incredible driver of what's going on with the dynamic of the system. There were 25 people or companies or banks or um, investment funds that uh, sell and buy this product before getting produced. This is a major player in this scheme. And the other factor is this. I don't know how familiar are you with this. <coughs> Uh, factor land grabbing. Are you? No. Oh, I get some novel here. So. <laughs> land, grabbing, land grabbing is the process of buying or leasing large pieces of, large pieces of land, mainly 
or I, I would say almost exclusively, in developing countries by different actors. It may be domestic or, or transnational companies, it may be governments, or it may be individuals. And this is something that start to happen mainly associated with the development of these financial markets. They, people see that the speculation associated with uh, agricultural commodities can be a good, uh, a good business, and so start to uh, access to um, the production systems through this process of land grabbing. This is a map <coughs> that show with this gray, green color, the countries that experience land grabbing uh, process. So they are selling or uh, leasing, leasing out land. As you see, the Latin American countries that experience this change in the agricultural area per person are some of the countries that get uh, a large piece of their uh, land uh, grabbed or selling. And there are some countries that may play a dual role. They can be land grabbers and land grab, uh, how you say? They can buy or sell land. And it doesn't appear in this map because they are transnational companies that are operating. Those are major players in this process of land grabbing. Uh, I want to. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, disagree with your definition of land grabbing. Um, in, my, <laughs> in, my, in my country, especially... Where, where are you from? Nigeria. Nigeria. Especially uh, in, the, in the southwest that I know very much about. Uh, at times, the consent of the owner is not sought. You may go to your land rightfully purchased and you meet people who are demanding that you buy it all over again. Mm. If you give any resistance, you may be killed or maimed, that kind of thing. Then the, the government, uh, there is a land rule since 1978 that limits, uh, that uh, says that all lands belong to the government. So since then, if you buy any land, you have to backdate to before 1978 or 1978. And uh, that has given the government a lot of power over the, gener over the citizens. So any government can get off at any day and take all your land for what you care. And uh, you, you will now start some process of uh, uh, maybe uh, compensation or that sort of thing. So that is why I say I disagree. Yeah, but yeah. you know, I'm not saying that it's, you, you know, it's not just buying land. It will be a, pro a process. Actually, one important thing is that these companies or some countries are not buying the land. Sometimes because they cannot, because the land is owned by the, by the state. It could be a case. It's not the case in, in Latin America. But the other thing is that they get rights to use the land. And this is the least kind of, there are different mechanisms to access to the land. Of course, they are behind the land grabbing process, a lot of heterogeneity of mechanisms that it depends on the country. And, and the access to the land, uh, requires special strategies depending on where you are. In the case of Latin America, I, I actually, I don't know what happened in, in Nigeria. I think it's Nigeria it doesn't appear, no? Nigeria is here, no? Ah, it's here, yes. 
Yeah, it appeared like uh, <clears throat> um, there were cases of in Nigeria. I make a parenthesis of I I I was pretty sure that it was in Nigeria where the some Argentinian agronomists get hired by companies that go to do uh, agriculture, industrial agriculture, agribusiness companies doing large piece of uh, or, or cultivating large piece of lines for doing soybean. I remember because there were a former student of us in my college that went there and I don't know what kind of trouble get and, and get in the in the news, and it was part of the. Um, of this land grabbing process. So yeah, it means that it's not a matter of countries. It's not a matter of nationality. It's a matter, it's a matter of economic drivers or economic actors that are playing globally. Yes, it's not that the, oh, we see here the uh, uh, Libya or Egypt, they are getting land all over. No, it's not a matter of um, kind of um, uh, blame a country, which to some extent makes sense because they don't much, they don't have much agricultural land. It's a matter of understand the process and how a lot of economic and uh, normative rules that are operating globally are shaping the land transformation in remote parts. So some decisions, some decisions taken in the cereal market of Chicago in the United States that regulate the amount of uh, uh, soybean or wheat that you may trade, uh, I don't know in which way, determines the possibilities or the uh, uh, advantages for that, that may get companies to buy land in South America or in Africa. So it's a complex process. It's a process that got different mechanisms in different countries. One of the major characteristics is that it is operating at global scale. So you got actors. Agriculture is not a matter of what happened with farmers, peasants, or local government is something else. And this is a revolution in the way we understand agriculture. Because introduce some new players and relationships in the, in the business. So we, we, I was just presenting what is land grabbing. As you may see, this is a major issue that requires a lot of of discussion. And I'm quite sure that I'm not the best person to discuss all the, the mechanisms. But I know that there are people from um, from both the, the economy and from both the uh, uh, ecological science, uh, science trying to uh, understand this issue. There is a paper in uh, the proceeding of National Academy of Science two years ago, I cannot remember the first author right now. What? The, is the, uh, Dodorico is one of the authors. From the, they were a guy from Virginia Tech. This guy was from University of Virginia. I can I can look at the details. Um, analyzing globally who are the the, the players in this game and looking at how much land is grabbed in one direction and in the other. <coughs> the point that I want to make with this is that the focus of this process of land grabbing is in the Gran Chaco and the Rio de la Plata grassland. is where these uh, companies, countries are uh, getting access to, to the land. 
<coughs> those are those are factors that operate at a global scale. What it means that they are very hard to specialize. So if, if I want to understand why this piece of land in southern Bolivia got a different chance to be transformed than this piece of land in central Argentina, from this information globally, I get nothing. There's, this is operating all over the world. Uh, the, the changes in the prices of the commodity, the, the land grabbing process, etc. Et I need to go locally and work with the spatial explicit drivers to understand the spatial and temporal differences that may uh, occur over an area like the Chaco region. And basically, the problem here is having one dependent variable, that is the rate of change, the probability of change of a piece of land, and getting a set of potential candidates to explain this change. So the first step is getting this list, getting a list that includes biophysical variables, precipitation, water deficit, evapotranspiration, temperature, topography, the soil type, socioeconomic uh, factor, the distance, uh, the distance to uh, different si uh, localities with different, or towns with different size, the distance to local market, the, the infrastructure, um, some variables related with the landscape means what is the distance of previous areas that were already deforested? What is the density of areas deforested at different scales? And also, we need to include some what we may call political uh, variables. Because on top of this, we got all the legislation, the normatives, and also the governance problems associated with land transformation. For example, we need to consider administrative limit. We, we saw before that the pattern of change in, uh, of the pattern of deforestation were clearly different in Bolivia, in Argentina, and in Paraguay. And within the countries, it may be different depending on, for example, the province. In, the, in Argentina, in the province of Salta, changes may operate different than in Santiago del Estero. It's a federal country, got different laws, get different regulations, different governance, and different actors operating in the system. And of course, we have to talk, we have to consider also the formal institutions in the forms of law that are operating in the system. Getting the list is the first step. The other point is to get these um, uh, factors in a, a way that we can quantify them, that we can describe the spatial and temporal variability that they have. So we need to access to descriptions that uh, allowed to generate basically spatial explicit description of these variables. And, and this is not a, major, a, a minor task. It's, it's something hard. We need to come up with some imaginative solutions because they are not data that we are just going out and collect. We need to get from secondary data. We need to combine secondary data to get the information that we need. When we get this, a dependent variables and independent variables, we need in the middle a model. A model that allows us to connect both set of variables and answer the question that we are interested in on that 
of all these variables, which are the most important, which has a significant effect on the rate of transformation experience in the Grand Chaco in this case. There are many models that you may use. Probably one of, one of the most common and popular are the logistic regression models, models that allow to provide an estimate for, a pro, for the probability of a particular event, the transformation of the land. There are many, many others, regression trees, there are uh, neural networks, and it depends on the type of data and some probably personal preferences to come up with this idea. In this case, uh, one of the students working on the group worked with <coughs> logistic models to explore the relative importance of all these factors. And what, what he gets is this, basically a graph of the different factors listed in the, uh, in the previous slide. Actually, they are not all, because some of them got no influence <laughs> at all. So they were absolutely irrelevant. The system or the dynamic of the system doesn't care if, I don't know, the power road or see the distance of the power road, or the, if the temperature is different in the spring. No, temperate, but I don't remember which one. <laughs> Sorry. Well, but there were some that uh, got no importance here. And in the y axis is the uh, contribution of this uh, each of these variables in explaining the patterns observed in the, <coughs> in the um, rate of transformation of the system. And, and you may see there are a lot of factors, and there are three bars. One corresponds to, you, you remember that we were talking about three periods, it's the, the, the basically on the same analysis. The, this bar corresponds to the changes in the 80s, in the 90s, and in the, in the 21th century. So the patterns do not change very much through time. If you go a little bit, it's got this little label there that is bothering me now. But what, what it happened with the controls of um, deforestation is that, as you may see, there is one that is the most important. And it's telling that the process of deforestation is a contagion process. The most important predictor of a deforestation is having an area deforested very close to them. This is the most important. This is a way to uh, win the bet on which piece of land will be deforested. Of course, precipitation, slope, and temperature play an important role. But the important thing is that all these factors get less importance through time. So at the very beginning of the process, the relative importance of precipitation or temperature was higher than at the very back, at, at the very end of the um, process. This is something that we learn from this analysis. The other interesting thing is to see what happened with the relative importance of the factors that uh, Jose Volante analyzed if we consider or we do not consider a important change that happened in the middle of this period, <laughs> that is the enactment of a national forest law that 
basically in Argentina, this is just for Argentina, define which part of a province can be transformed, uh, the, the forest can be transformed into agriculture, and which ones are not. So basically, each province has to paint the provinces in three colors. Red, you cannot transform this land, the, the forest must remain as they are, and you can do nothing there. Yellow, you must keep the forest. You cannot uh, transform the forest, but you can use it, the forest. So you can log, uh, do logging. You can uh, raise cattle or whatever with a defined management plan. And there are some, some areas, the, the green one, that can be transformed uh, with a uh, proper management plan. So does it have an effect on what happened with the probability of transformation? It got a little effect. So if the, the total contribution, it got a 12% of contribution, a significant one, but if you are a legislator, a representative, say, wow, I make all the effort to get this low pass, all this negotiation, and it changed. And it got this little amount of impact on the way we transform the landscape. This is again telling something about how the process of land transformation is operating. What happened here? I don't know. The, the sonification of the province was not good enough. It's actually representing what is actually going on. So people, the, the provinces painted red what, is, what cannot be transformed for some other reasons. It could be. Uh, there are a lot of illegal deforestation. So. Uh, we got the law, but let's get the caterpillar and get rid of this forest. That's another explanation. We need to get into it. So what we can say is that the impact is relatively modest, relatively small compared with the other factors that are operating. And here, go back to your question. Now we can do something better than the than we did before, that is, come up with a map <coughs> that basically, uh, base, based again on the knowledge that we got of the systems, provide an idea of what is the um, spatial distribution of the probability of transformation of the land. So we had now a piece of information to devise policy, uh, conservation policies, to uh, come up with um, uh, special explicit instruments to promote or avoid the changes in the landscape, or to make projections to the, to the future. No? <clears throat> this is not actual change, but the probability of changes. As you see, for example, these blue areas got a very low chance to be transformed. The, the green areas got a moderate but low level of transformation, and these red brown areas are those that got a high chance of uh, being deforested for agriculture. So we go through this, actually through an example of how to get hypotheses on the drivers of land use and land cover change. I will say that it's an example, but the, the basic structure of the approach is, is quite general. There are many models and many uh, examples where actually what we get 
is this either probability of transitions or models that compile. Um, the, the probability of transition is a kind of a brute force approach or models, mechanistic models, that try to understand the relative contribution of different factors and apply these models to generate scenarios. Let's move now to the third point that we want to discuss in this diagram, which are the, once, once the lands get transformed, which are the consequences of <coughs> these changes on process that take place both in the human and in the biophysical dimension. And I need to change the presentation. And, well, some of the consequences are pretty obvious. If you look, this is a, one example of a graph that I keep it in Spanish, sorry, but this is clear with time. <laughs> and here we got the cropped area in millions of hectares for the uh, Chaco region. And, as you, and, and those are crops, oats some flour, corn, soybean, sorghum, and wheat. And as you may see, there is a, a major consequence that, a major consequence that is the, this incredibly increase in the amount uh, of the area cropped with soybean, the one that is in, in red. They got a lot of consequences in terms of income, uh, it got a lot of consequences in fiscal terms because there are uh, change, uh, there are different kind of taxes on the different crops, there are consequences on the, um, <coughs> we're going to see the conflicts generated, the amount of employment generated, et cetera, et cetera. You were asking when. Hi, just curious, going back just to the previous thought about it being a density dependent process, the contagion issue for deforestation is the most mm -hmm. important factor. Um, is I'm just curious, based on your research over the years, is it because it's the same landowners buying more land? Or is it that the neighbors see that their neighbor is making money on this land now and they want to do the same thing? Do you know what the mechanism is that is there, promoting that? They are both. Okay. So there are a, a contagion process associated with um, uh, neighbors copying uh, successful, an economic successful results from their neighbor. And there is also this land grabbing process. So there are, uh, one thing that happened is that uh, around the first uh, nuclear of transformation, uh, big companies from all over the world are getting large pieces of uh, uh, land that start to get transformed. And within our, our particular farms, and when we are talking farms, they are huge. They are thousands of hectares. So they are pretty large areas. The process is start, uh, it's not that in one year everything gets transformed. So it's a process that uh, takes a few years. So this is, some, this is something that also explains the contagion process because the, the, the dynamic of what's going on inside one particular farm. And the result in the human dimension, one of the results in the human dimension is this. One important thing here is that this is not happened for everywhere. We need to go back to 
this scheme with the blue and, and red guys over there because these changes are very important for one part of the actors. I'm probably the people from Argentina will recognize this place, but it's the uh, kind of an iconic place for the big landowners of the, uh, the, the big landowners in, in Argentina. So those people are capturing the income derived from this increase in the area crop and in, in the amount produced of soybean and are capturing basically this yellow bar here, the private one. But I show you that in the Chaco there are other actors. I don't know if it's the blue or the red here that live in the forest and use the forest. So how these changes impact on this population. And Maria Vallejos get a map of these points correspond to the location of the communities of Aboriginal people uh, from one particular etnia, the witches, is one of the etnias that live in the Chaco. This is an area that correspond, I will say, 10% of the whole Chaco area is the Salta province. And what he get also, what she get also, Maria, was an idea of how people from this community use the resources. These lines here correspond to tracks made with GPS of the area that people from the community where they get the base camp, uh, move to get different things. Firewood, uh, food, fibers to make crafts, and so on. So from these areas, she may calculate what are the, uh, the area from, they where, the, from where they get resources. What are the part of the forest that those people are using? And define in a GIS as buffers around the base camp. What happened with the transformation that generate this uh, huge increase in the production of commodities for one of the stakeholders? The result uh, is that for each of these buffers, the ones from they get food and water, uh, um, I don't know, firewood and fibers for special craft, get a, pr a process of reduction in these terms, 15 years, the reduction is around 30% of the area. So they get 30% less access to resources than previously. And this is just putting on the table the magnitude of the conflict. When we listed the, the changes that occur in the human dimension, we say that one is the production of commodities, one is the production of conflict. And this is the manifestations. This, in, this increase in the production of soybean is associated with the reduction in the access of resources for some of the other inhabitants, some of the other stakeholders of the forest. And we are discovering something new. No, the conflicts are in the newspaper. People die associated with, it, with this stuff. Some of these conflicts get resolved with guns. You may know, probably. And what he's doing is putting on the table the numbers to make the discussion more rational. So we know that people used forests. We know that they based their livelihood on those resources. And we quantify the magnitude of the loss that they are experiencing 
uh, experienced due to the increase in the production of uh, commodities that got a, a, a private uh, appropriation. So let's move us to uh, an important issue in the discussion of the consequences. We cannot treat the consequences for a uniform society. There is not such thing as a society. There are actually a diversity of stakeholders that base, the, they got cultural differences, they are legacies completely different, they use resources in a completely different way, they base their economies on a completely different set of resources and get some other, uh, well, get uh, their economy based on, on different res results. Well, here is the ab Aboriginal communities, the Creole people, people that they were not original, uh, were not native Argentinian or native Bolivians, but they were descendant from the first uh, European that colonized the, the area, and they are the agribusiness company. Those people base their economy on livestock production, either goats or cows, and those people got their economy based on replacing the, the forest to cultivate uh, uh, soybean, basically. So, we need to map and understand the relationships that derives from this diversity of stakeholders. And one interesting thing is that, or I don't know if it is interesting, one thing that complicates things is that these interactions go from local, the agribusiness sectors, the creoles, the indigenous communities, up to the international or the global level, where there are global consum uh, consumers, international NGOs, multilateral institutions, going through so national uh, NGOs, national governments, regional NGOs, and provincial governments. And among all these actors playing a role in the transformation of the Chaco, <coughs> there are different kinds of interactions. There are resistance and conflict. There are some uh, connections and uh, uh, cooperations. And there are some towing, so they are some, they are pulling the decision from a different level. Understanding this is basically to understand these things that we call the governance of the systems. So how the different actors, stakeholders in, the, uh, in, a, in, in a particular territory interact among them and how they find the rules of these interactions. Of course, this is a dynamic process. This is a dynamic in, in different things because external factors change, so the, there is a rearrangement of these things, but it's also an, uh, it's dynamic because the actors that are playing are able to change this relationship. They're playing an important role. Do you have an idea for the turnover time, the residence time that's needed for these Chaco drylands to, to maintain themselves? In other words, like how long does it take for a forest to cycle? To recover, for example. Yes, ex for instance. W uh, yes, this is, let's make a parenthesis. When this is a, 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 an important question related with how we uh, operate with the, with the rest of the society, with the decision makers, with the politicians, and so on. During the sanction of the, this national forest law in Argentina, 
one of the discourse, the, the, the main things that people from national NGO or international NGOs, Greenpeace, stress is when one piece of forest is lost, is lost forever. This is a very strong statement, no, because wow, so and and it was very important during the process of getting people convinced on the importance of the law and so on. Uh, when the get when the when the law was enacted, this kind of argument kind of start to have problems because there were a lot of illegal deforestation. The law do not prevent the sanctions. So it was kind of a funny thing because it say, well, you cannot go with your car through a red traffic light. But we didn't think of putting tickets on this. What happened? <laughs> this is the way things work. So there were not tickets. Or they were <laughs> tickets that they're not uh, strong enough to make change. So when people get transformed the forest into an agriculture, and we say, hey, you transformed the forest. Oh, yeah, the forest is lost. But as you said, the forest is lost forever. So let's keep doing soybean right now. So one important line of uh, research in the, uh, in the scientific community is try to understand if this is true. Of course, it's not true. But we need to put numbers. And actually, what we learn from looking at the um, structural characteristics, the, the changes in the floristic composition, in the structure of the forest, in, in the functional characteristic of the forest, how it changes how the, the carbon gain changes, how the evapotranspiration, the phenology, and so on, is that in 20 years, you get back a forest that is similar enough in terms of provision of ecosystem services than the one that gets replaced. So now we need to replace this idea that was pretty important and pretty effective in the process of enacting the, lay, the law for this one. Whoa, 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 whoa. If you change the forest, just sit in a chair over there and wait 20 years, and you get the forest back. And, and this is an, an important change that we need. And, and it's an important contribution of the scientific community to the, discuss, the political discussion of uh, how to deal with this situation of illegal de deforestation. So we got this mess with many local act many um, actors and players in different uh, areas. One important piece of information when you have to deal at the local level with the um, in, in a socio-ecological system, you get a proper map. I will not get into the details of this, but I'm just showing the complexity of this, what we call a stakeholder map. So first, get an inventory of all the potential stakeholders. So we got different ONGs, uh, international institutions, public institutions, universities, we got the uh, institution from the local government, from the federal government, we got the different associations of ranchers and farmers, we got the community, the Aboriginal community, the Creole families, uh, indigenous organizations and so on. And we need to, aside from getting an inventory, a list of the players start to put these actors in, in this plane. 
a plane that describes an axis of influence of or power. How is the power that this particular stakeholder have to change the situation, they have an influence on what's going on with, for example, deforestation. You can not build this map without a problem, a conflict, a situation in mind. Now, the, the stakeholder map will be completely different if instead of deforestation, the problem will be, I don't know, if Messi have to be the number 10 of the national team of Argentina, for example. <clears throat> So, the other axis is what are the level of dependence or interest that this particular actor has in this problem? So, you play here public institution that got no major interest on what's going on, or these institutions do not depend, their existence do not depend on uh, the situation that we are dealing with, and some others that are very, very interested or directly linked to this, uh, the, the Aboriginal community. Up here, here, where the interest is high and the dependence is high and the influence and power low, and the agribusiness companies appear here. The other important thing that you need to construct and this is a major challenge, is putting all these arrows. As you see, there are different colors. These arrows define the string and the type of the relationship. There are positive and negative relations, strong and weak relationship between these actors. Understanding this map is critical to operate in the system, because some of the changes that you were pointed out, how this process of contagion, deforestation, take place, is related with the way these actors relate to each other, influencing, uh, uh, avoiding, or whatever you may imagine that happened in there, uh, the process of transformation. <clears throat> so, we got some of the aspect that we need to, to consider in the consequences in the human dimension. Clearly, the production of commodity increased. Clearly, income of some actors increased we get into some other more complicated, diffuse kind of consequences that are the conflicts that uh, may arise from these changes. Let's move now to this part of the, <coughs> of the graph that are the consequences on the, on the biophysical dimension. The consequences on what we call the provision of ecosystem services. And of course, this arrow there show that both are clearly communicated, that it's very hard to sink on the provision of ecosystem services without, without having in mind what are the stakeholders, the actors that demand these ecosystem services. And to discuss that, I will try to make a stop and see a little bit what is the conceptual framework of ecosystem services uh, telling us on how to deal with this dimension. Again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this conceptual framework, and I'm taking the risk of boring you, boring some of you, or uh, be talking of something that, what the hell is this guy doing? It, uh, and I take the risk. Let me know after the, the talk. So, 
So this is a controversial issue. The, 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 the uh, idea of ecosystem services, an idea that is not, I, I put the, the names of some of the, who promote the, the idea of ecosystem, of ecosystem, of uh, socio-ecological systems. If I have to put the, um, there are many faces that we can put associated to the ecosystem services. Actually, some of them are part of the uh, scientific committee of the IAI, Hal Mooney, for example. And, and it's something that started in the 80s. And since then, many people take the idea and start to work, and some start to, uh, start to work. Some start to talk just on ecosystem services, where it's a problem. And Jonathan Silverton, Jonathan Silverton is a population ecologist. This guy count uh, seedlings in the field and do experiments calculating the rate of uh, increase of a population and so on. They wrote an excellent textbook on population ecology that I used to study population ecology. And last year wrote this paper kind of mad on what's going on with ecosystem services, how ecosystem services been oversold, and this is the, the abstract, and I want to put some emphasis on his last, last sentence. I attempt to show how the ecosystem service paradigm has constrained so particular towards the monetization and financialization of nature even when many ecologists and others oppose this trend. And this is a major kind of divide that you find in ecosystem services or, or around ecosystem services. This idea that we have to put a number, mainly with a sign of pesos, dollars, reales, euros, or whatever we want to use, and those that um, say, there is no way that we do that. We cannot, uh, commo, commo, this is a very hard word, commoditize, uh, the commodi commoditization of nature. You get more or less the idea. And even in Spanish, it's hard for me to say it. <clears throat> and so, there is this kind, these two disputes. Clearly, Silverton is in one of these sides. Say, no way we can do it. There are some other avenues. Now, there are not, I'm not saying that there's something in the middle. There are other dimensions on which we can sink on ecosystem services that get rid of this uh, dimension, or of this dispute. We're going to try to understand a little bit this because it's critical to move the ecosystem services framework into the decision-making arena. This is not a trivial academic discussion. On, around this discussion, we decide if we're going to be using this idea to take decisions or just we're going to forget it. <clears throat> Let's back to this scheme. I'm, I'm taking advantage. I, I take quite a long time to make this thing with colors, so, but I'm using it. So, I, <coughs> <coughs> where are in this scheme the ecosystem services? And when you start to look, I don't know. And actually, it depends on one important thing: how you define ecosystem service. And when you look to the, when you go to the literature and start to get all the books, because there are many books, papers, actually journals devoted to ecosystem services, you get basically two families of definitions of ecosystem services. One of them, these are two examples of one of them. This is, uh, the ecosystem services are the benefits people obtain from ecosystems. This is from one of the more 
most influential book on ecosystem service that is this Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, 10 or more years ago, that uh, can put together uh, the ideas of many scientists working on, on, on this issue and provide a, a very good uh, summary of what we know at that time on ecosystem services. And this other is from a very famous paper. And I'm, I'm an author of this paper. And I'm, I'm not convinced with the definition that we use at that time. So I change it. What, I don't know. I think that it's good to change. B again, benefits that human population derive directly or indirectly from ecosystem functions. The other family is, or say that uh, the ecosystem services are wide range, range of condition and process through which natural ecosystems and the species that are part of them help sustain and fulfill human life. The word benefit do not appear. Actually, the subject of the sentence that here is benefit, here is range of condition and process, basically the structure and function of ecosystems, plus biodiversity. And this other one that kind of summarizes uh, a bunch of different definitions say that ecosystem services are the aspects of ecosystem structure and function utilized actively or passively through to produce human well-being. So if we go back to my scheme, I keep using it, the in this def in uh, based on these definitions Ecosystem services are here, the benefits. You know, the ones that are outside the systems and are clearly related with the interests, the cultural values, the political relationship among the stakeholders. In this case, ecosystem services are within the system, are part of the structure and function of the system. So the level of provision is different here than here because the carbon gains change, the uh, biodiversity change, the evapotranspiration or whatever, the dimension of the um, structure of uh, functioning of the ecosystem service are we using. Actually, those definitions are or put the discussion of the ecosystem services in the arena of ecological economics. Constanza was clearly one of the leaders of this approach. And this one put the discussion of ecosystem services in the arena of, I will say, traditional ecology, community and ecosystem ecology. <clears throat> what is, in turn, behind these definitions? Actually, it's the idea of value, because these definitions are clearly associated, or most of the attempts to study ecosystem services are associated to put value on ecosystem services. And value is a tricky concept because it depends on which kind of environment you define value. Value for ethics denotes the degree of importance of something or action. And for economic, in, in economics, value is a measure of the benefit that we gain from good, uh, that might be gain, gained from goods and services. So those definitions are clearly related with a concept of value related with different, I will say, disciplines or, um, uh, I don't know, conceptual spaces.
not surprising the way that we as our academic community develop to, I will say, quantify, quantify slash value ecosystem services are very different. This is a kind of summary from Gomez Bajetum in and the Grot, a, a very good one, <coughs> that basically define on one side a set of methods, here are the methods and tools that we may use to quantify value ecosystem services that are derived from the market theory, the neoclassic economic theory. And here we got, of course, market analysis, cost method, production function, market analysis, hedonic pricing, contingent evaluation, avoided cost, uh, mitigation cost, contingent election. Well, there are many of them going around. Probably you know many of them. I use most of them for this paper in Costanza, where I was uh, in charge of getting the value for, in economic terms, for grassland. I'm a grassland ecologist at the very end of what you see here. <laughs> um, and all these methods basically want to put a price put a number in terms of dollars, gens, or whatever currency we may imagine on on a particular ecosystem service. Here we got biophysical approaches instead of preference-based approaches. This line is clearly associated with, um, you remember that it, early in the morning I show you uh, um, scheme, a graph based on shaping, and the uh, graph got a clear connection with the Resilient Alliance group, people that is thinking the socio-ecological system in terms of adaptative, adaptative cycles, panarchies, that is a complex uh, concept that we are not getting into right now, and then we got this physical consumption approach. They got two, two branches. One is related with HTODUM, that basically calculate this idea of embodied energy into uh, uh, a product, in this case, an ecosystem services, and some others based on basically material flow analysis, the ecological footprints, changes as so the, the dynamic of land cover. This is clearly the arena of ecological economics, and this is the arena of ecology. Here we have a problem, because we separate two approaches based on backgrounds and ideas, a conceptual framework. This is not something that I like. I will think that the way to integrate, the, the best thing we can do is trying to integrate and to understand what are the, the problems and, and get a communication between two approaches. I clearly work on this. So I'm not uh, free of sin on this. I also work it on this one and I discard it. And I seen I was wrong. And I was wrong because what I finally end up calling the Mosheja paradox. Who knows what is Mosheja? Who knows what is Mosheja? You like call Mosheja? Absolutely. Me too. Mosheja is probably, this is Mosheja. And this is what happened with Mosheja. You got, ah, oh, yeah, because it may seem the best thing in the world for Holman, for me, or something disgusting. No, it's, basically it's the salivary gland of the cow. This is the, and 
Um, how many try Mosheha here? One, two, three. Do you try? Five, ten, well, I say 15 people. Of those that do not try, <coughs> did not try Mosheha, who going to try it? Nobody. <laughs> and this is the problem. The problem, if you go to an Uruguayan supermarket, I checked it yesterday, basically one kilo of mosheja costs $10 in, in, in Uruguayan pesos. A lot of money. Probably it's the most expensive piece of meat or part of inside the cow you might get. When I lived, when I was doing my PhD in, in, in Colorado, we went with some friends from Argentina to the supermarket, and they gave us the mosheja, sweet bread in, in, in English, for free. So we got these big asados of just mosheja, because it's something disgusting for them. And this is the basis. But, and the same happened, let's see, on the other way around. Yeah, but, but this is a tuna eye that is incredibly expensive in a Japanese market. They are not Japanese here? No. It's incredibly expensive. And actually, I will pay for, do not see the tuna eye. So this is even negative. So behind this is the problem of all the approaches based on the market theory is extremely dependent on cultural values, cultural values that divide things. Most of those that uh, raise their hands are Argentinian, Uruguayan, or adopted, <laughs> some, uh, uh, converted. Uh, uh, Argentinians or Uruguayans. So, there are some cultural values associated that my father showed me from when I was a kid. Oh, this is great. Try, just try it. And, this, and I start to love it. And some other not. And the other thing, there are uh, individual preferences. Even in Argentina or Uruguay, there are people that they are uh, vegan. And if you show this, they will kill you. How you can eat this? Or those that think, I cannot eat uh, mosheja anymore because I'm starting to have some cholesterol problems. So, again, I'm changing my preference. All this stuff that may sound funny are behind all the process of putting a value on ecosystem services. It's impossible to get rid of these problems. We can try to find some ways around and so on. But the problem is intrinsic to those approaches that trying to come up with a uh, monetization or whatever you say it right of the ecosystem service. So not surprising after all this that I said is that I move around the, uh, the life with this definition of ecosystem services that are the aspect of ecosystem utilized actively or passively for human beings. It's 12.30, so we may stop and continue with the expanding this idea of behind this definition in the afternoon. What do you think? Some questions, comments? Um, hello. Uh, I wanted to know all the, because we were speaking about ecosystem services, like, um, and I wanted to see how is included the notion of amenities in ecosystem services. Well, the. You know, one, one important thing that uh, the Millennium Assessment 
book did is to provide a, a kind of basic classification of ecosystem services that separate, on one side, uh, provision, ecosystem service of provisions that are basically those related with food, fiber, uh, timber, or whatever we need to build something or uh, keep us alive. Then there is another category that is regulation services. Actually, is what we clearly identify that ecosystem service. Water regulation, the regulation of the composition of the uh, atmosphere, climate regulation, um, well, so on. Then there is a, a different set that there are cultural ecosystem services that are the amenities. It's the, the, um, the beauty of the landscape, the inspiration that provides a landscape, and so on. And then they got a, a fourth category that is uh, the supporting ecosystem services, where they put a lot of stuff. For example, the nutrient dynamic, the um, uh, primary production, and so on. They got some problems with this definition because it appears something that is kind of ghost in many of the quantification of ecosystem services that is double counting the provision of ecosystem services. Because if you are looking at the, are quantifying or valuing the production of uh, timber, the production of forage and primary production, actually you are dealing with the same because everything is tied to the carbon gains that are described by um, the primary production. So I don't know if I answer your question with this. No. Allá hay una pregunta. Pero vos ibas a preguntar. Sí. Bueno. Entonces. I think that uh, is a big challenge, but how can you put a price to the ecosystem service uh, in the biophysical approach? Uh, I don't want to put a price. <laughs> oh. So I, I th there are many things that we um, actually when. When we look at ourselves as a society, we take a lot of decisions without putting price to things. And we value life aside from uh, the production of this life. So if you kill someone, it doesn't matter if you kill uh, a football star or a, a homeless. The value is the same because we get into a position as humanity that we value life aside from society may get from this person. We don't need to price this life. Then there is another approach that say, well, if you go to an insurance company, they will not put the same price on my leg than on Messi's leg. That's to put a, so the, I, I will have to pay a prime that is way lower than, the, than Messi. So there is this thing. In, in a biophysical approach, what you're going to get, and we're going to see it later, is how the level of provision, of supply, let's say, of ecosystem services change under different conditions. And you compare that. And you may say, as a society, or as part of the society, which is the level you, of reduction of the supply of ecosystem services that you are able to tolerate, without putting a price. Hi. Uh, I also work in the past with ecosystem service valuation, and I don't like it anymore. And but. Sometimes I think that uh, ecosystem gives us a lot of research uh, and they have economic value, for example, fish and timber. And I think that 
maybe in decision maker process is important to show that value uh, i don't know so maybe in provision services i think that i still think that is uh, have has some some importances but in other kind of services i don't think that and i i want to know what do you think uh, I, of course they are what um, I, I was a little bit extreme on that i think that there is circumstances where uh, pricing some ecosystem services may be useful. And one of them are commodities. And commodities, for, by definition, got a global price. So there is no dispute like with the mosheja or the tuna ice on the value of soybean. They got a global market and it costs the same everywhere. So this is clearly a good derived from an ecosystem services that is way easier to um, uh, evaluate on economic terms. There are some other circumstances where it may be useful. For example, there are some examples, this idea of putting price to the ecosystem services is clearly related with uh, another area that is the payment for ecosystem services as a way to define policies. And this is a, a mess of many different things. But in some, in some cases, it works. For example, in some cases related with provision of water, there are very good examples of come up with a number for avoiding cost of um, treating the water and so on, that get a number, a local number, for uh, paying for the service of keeping the forest in the, in the upper basin. I will say, and, and your question is, is very important for this, that I will not trust on a general approach based on market basis for um, uh, quantify value on ecosystem service. There are special cases. I will sing on these two, but I'm open to some others uh, where it doesn't work. And, and the other thing, well, it'll take one more minute. There are, when, when we confront the idea of putting price on ecosystem services, there are uh, different arguments against the, um, the, the economic approach or the market approach. Some of the arguments are pragmatic. So it's extremely difficult. It's basically the, the Mosheja paradox. No, how we come up at the end of the day with a price, a value for Mosheja? It's impossible. This is something that is based on a pragmatic uh, argument. But there are also some more, I will say, ideological uh, approaches that I care the most. There are some things on which uh, the, the idea of putting uh, prices through a market mechanism got some assumption behind. One is that there are some economists here and, and one of the assumptions of the market economy is that the market do not modify the product. So the, the way the market function do not change intrinsically soybeans, nor televisions, nor uh, uh, shoes. No, this is true. But for some issues, for some uh, things, this is not true. Market changed the nature of the product. And there are a lot of people working on political philosophy dealing with this stuff. Uh, I don't remember the name. The, the last name is Sandel, a guy from Harvard University. He got some lectures on, on internet look at them on some TED conference, you know, the TED conference, 
that are very good. And he show you the, uh, the some cases where it's clearly that the market, the, the commodification of a product or, or something changed the nature of the product. For example, this is an extreme one, friendship. Let's say that we generate a market for friendship. So instead of going to see the football match with you guys, that, well, let's go, we have, we're going to have fun with uh, my friend, I say, well, I'm going to call this 800 number, get a friend, and you get a friend that go to the, to the football match. You get a friend there? No. And in the same moment that you pay for this service, the concept of friendship vanish. The same happened with other stuff, with many other stuff. For example, the voluntary or mercenary military services. So uh, there are many things. This is something that applies also to the uh, ecosystem services. The putting in a market change the nature of the ecosystem service and the way we perceive it. Probably it's not as, as extreme as the friendship, I know but uh, it may go in the same direction. Uh, something similar can be said, al uh, said also for political decisions. Uh, the example of deforestation. The Swedish government or Swedish parliament um, passed a law or was discussing a law to limit deforestation within Sweden and to even revert some of the agricultural lands to forests. So uh, the agricultural uh, community started planting rows of trees on the edges of the properties of the parliamentarians who then no longer saw the landscape but a row of trees. The law was never passed. So it's, it's uh, in the political decision-making process we have the same kind of value. Yeah. Well, let's have lunch. <laughs>